in the Bernie Fine investigation on campus anyway. It's been pretty quiet following <laughs> the dramatic set of events that unfolded yesterday. And this ruling came about 45 minutes or so ago. Uh, we were actually uh, waiting outside Supreme Court chambers for the better part of 45 minutes to an hour. Just this place is extremely packed and for good reason. Let's take a look at some of this food. I'm hanging out with the boaters here just off the main stage and look at how close we are. This is just a perfect view as we've been reporting for the past hour or so. No propane has leaked from that overturned freight car. So right now authorities can play the waiting game, so to speak, before trying to put that back upright. In just about an hour, the Syracuse Common Council is expected to breathe new life into the review board that really acts, as you said, as a watchdog over Syracuse police. And it's an all-out effort to clean up in Savannah. A strong storm is to blame for five damaged properties in the area, including the home of Carlton Gay, now without a roof. I'd never seen anything up north of town like this. And it's not just the roof of Carlton's home, from downed trees to shattered windows to personal belongings tossed around the yard. The home Carlton has lived in his whole life is now in shambles. We had no idea until we came down Route 89. We had no idea what what we would expect, but we didn't expect this. To give you a little perspective on just how powerful the storm really was, I want to bring you right across the street from Carlton's home into what used to be his massive red shed. But as you can see from the damage behind me, it was completely leveled in this storm. This damage speaks for itself, but comes as no surprise to the folks who rode out the storm. A lot of real high winds, and then we've got the hail and the rain real quick, and that real high winds rocked the truck a couple times. And... <laughs> it was like like we were in a boat with a rocking feeling. And getting a lot of credit right now, the swift response from local authorities and the Red Cross. Search for everybody, nobody was hurt. Uh, everybody walked out of this. One gentleman had a bloody nose, other than that, we're fine. We've got a great crew down here, um, set up to, to handle a mass of people in case they needed it. Uh, we only had, so had one family come in, the other ones we helped out in the field. Back at Carlton's home, this cleanup process will continue over the next few days, salvaging what wasn't completely destroyed or washed away in the storm. But as bad as all this looks, Carlton is just thankful everyone is okay. Reporting in Savannah, I'm Chris McGrath. <laughs> 10 years later, the images of September 11th are still raw. I remember it like it was yesterday. Across the country and right here in central New York, remembering those who are not here today. I just felt like I had to be here today for other people who lost their lives and their families and their loved ones. In DeWitt, an emotional ceremony honoring the victims of 9-11. Three fire departments, two police departments, and hundreds of people united on a bright, sunny, Sunday morning. It's very heartwarming to see the number of people that do come out. It's kind of, like I said, a unifying thing. You know, you forget about the differences, you forget about the unimportant things that you worry about. And a chilling reminder of that day 10 years ago is right in front of DeWitt's Town Hall. This 9-11 memorial was constructed just months after 9-11 and is made up entirely of a steel beam from one of the Twin Towers. I had to actually reach out and physically touch it because it just was unbelievable to actually see it and be here with that. But the day permanently etched in the mind of so many Americans. Watching those events, I knew my life would change forever. Is a day that has little meaning right now to a much younger generation. It's difficult. It's difficult to explain to a child. They've seen the footage. They can imagine in their own minds what has happened. And we just talk about how there's no reason to hate. The feeling here, what terrorists thought could tear this country apart 10 years ago, has only made it stronger that America truly is beautiful and that the victims of 9-11, the heroes, and the families will never be forgotten. <laughs> Reporting in DeWitt, I'm Chris McGrath. And of course, I remind you about Tuesday, which I know, you know, is fresh on your mind, yeah. On this final weekend before Election Day, candidates are busy going door to door trying to lock down votes. You're going to vote for me, right? I sure will. That's I appreciate it. Thank you. So, two supporters, yes, yard sign. Yes, good job. Democrat Khalid Bey and Green Party candidate Howie Hawkins are running against each other for a seat on the Syracuse Common Council. The fourth district seat represents the south and near west sides of the city. 
with voter turnout this year expected to be at an all-time low. Both candidates know they need to get voters to the polls. People are, you know, coming out and saying, you know, I'll vote for you on Tuesday, and I hope they do, <laughs> and I'm hoping they remember. We've identified a lot of supporters. We want to make sure they come out and vote on uh, Tuesday, November 8th. And while candidates still go door to door to meet folks and put up political signs, they also know this is the 21st century, and there's a 21st century approach to politics. Did you hear about the hawk running for office? Right now on YouTube, a cartoon put together by the Hawkins camp. The hawk is Howie Hawkins. He is running for the city council. Hawkins, who's no stranger to campaigns, is also on Facebook and Twitter. So is his opponent. It's like the automatic door to door. The person is definitely home. Bay says in this day and age, it's hard for candidates to ignore the power of social media. I make posts probably every other day as much as I can, particularly on Facebook. But both Bay and Hawkins say in such a localized race, it's often hard to find people online who actually live in their district. They say there's nothing quite like going door to door. People want to meet their uh, representatives and talk to them about the issues. And I've made that a priority in my campaign. When people have an opportunity to actually experience you, you know, the chances of them vote for you is a lot greater. Which is why both candidates say they'll keep knocking on doors, asking for votes. Reporting in Syracuse, I'm Chris McGrath.